Knowing these methods will give you the power and the tools to completely destroy every argument that a Christian could bring. It was learning these methods that sent the atomic bomb into my life and blew my whole world to pieces. As you've probably guessed from the introduction, I was not born Jewish. I'm a Gare. And for many years, I didn't always say that so easily. I've only recently been speaking out about my past, and we'll get to why later. But first, how did I get here? I didn't choose to be a Christian. Both of my parents are evangelical Christians. My father was a Assemblies of God minister. Much like Judaism, although we have different streams and different ways of doing things, the foundation of what we believe is the same. And likewise, throughout evangelical Christianity, the foundation is the same. The purpose is to evangelize. The meaning is in the name itself. So I was taught from a very young age to be a missionary as is anybody in the evangelical church. A common misconception is that a missionary is a paid professional, somebody who's paid to stand on the street corners with uh, tracks to give you and encounter you on the street. That's not true at all. In fact, the people who are screaming on a megaphone at Ben Yehuda often do us a tremendous favor because to a Jew, they're pretty offensive. They do our job for us because, honestly, they bring awareness to the missionary agenda more so than any of the counter-missionary organizations, all of us combined. The successful missionaries are the everyday church growers, the kid in your class, or the person that you work with. The Great Commission is the cornerstone of evangelical Christianity. It's an obligation. It's a commandment from Jesus himself to teach the gospel to the whole world and to baptize people in his name. It's taken very, very seriously. And I took it very seriously. My dedication to the church and my commitment to being a good Christian molded every, every part of my life. When the doors of the church were open, I was there and every mission that was available, I took part in. I started the very first Christian student union in my high school in Texas, and bringing as many people as I could to Christianity was a goal that I set for myself every single day. At first, this was with a world focus. I was pretty good at it. Unlike my father, who spoke to whole congregations, I found it more successful to, to do this one-on-one. -on -one. I had no problem sharing Jesus with my peers and inviting my friends to church. The first method that I was taught in order to lead somebody to Jesus was the emotional appeal. I would tell them, we're all sinners. None of us can possibly stand before a holy God in our sinful and blemished condition. Without Jesus, we're simply not worthy. But through him, we're forgiven. He bore the punishment for us. There's a verse that you see at baseball games and sporting events all the time. It's John 3.16. You've probably seen it. That verse says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shouldn't perish but have everlasting life. There are a lot of people in this world who, are, who feel alone and unloved. And you'd be surprised how easily this line works with young people who are looking to find themselves, looking to be accepted unconditionally, to feel that despite who and what you are, that somebody loved you enough that they were willing to die for you. That resonates for a lot of people. In my adult life, I took a turn specifically towards Jews. That was more of a challenge. Although evangelical teachings have a very world focus, 
Jews are definitely prioritized, and that's because they play a very specific eschatological role in the end times. This is found in the book of Matthew. It's when Jesus is speaking to a Jewish audience, and he says, I will not return until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The church has long accepted this to mean that Jesus can't bring about his second coming until the Jews in mass convert to Christianity. This is why you will find that missionaries will go to extraordinary lengths, take extraordinary measures to convert Jews that you don't see in the non-Jewish world. I took this mission very seriously. But the techniques required to convert a Jew were very different than the ones that I had learned growing up. Jews tend to be more intellectual about religion. To do this, I had to have more training. And the training involved with this meant learning a whole new way of presenting the gospel, a whole new way of speaking. Because let's be honest, the word Jesus Christ and crosses don't invoke any warm and fuzzy feelings with Jews. <laughs> Looking back, I see this as very deceptive and manipulating, but I didn't feel that way then. There's a verse in the New Testament to justify these deceptive tactics, and it's found in the letter of Paul. He says, to the Jew, I became a Jew. To those under the law, I became like one under the law to win those under the law. To the weak, I became weak to win those that were weak. I become all things to all men in order to save some. There are training manuals on this, and I brought one. It's uh, How to Share the Messiah with Your Jewish Friend. It's published by the Messianic Jewish Movement. It's an international organization. It's a whole manual full of useful information about Jews, Jewish culture, things you should talk about, things that you should avoid talking about, language you should avoid using. You might say that it's, it's a way to present Jesus in a more culturally sensitive way. In the middle of this handy little thing is a, a messianic soul winner's card. This is in case you ever encounter a Jew. In great big red letters on the top, it quotes that verse that we talked about, as a Jew to the Jews. And there are two columns. On the left side, it says, don't say. And on the right side, it says, do say. On the right side, it says, Jesus Christ. Don't say that. It doesn't sound very Jewish. <laughs> Instead, use his Hebrew name, Yeshua, or Messiah Yeshua. Don't say convert. Jews know that converting is not a good thing. Some believe that converting makes you a goy. They don't want to convert. Instead, say, become a messianic Jew, a completed Jew, a fulfilled Jew. Don't say Christian. That label is OK to use among other Christians, but never use it when you're talking to a Jew. Instead, say, a Bible believer. Don't say come to church. You can't get Jews to go to shul. They don't go to church. <laughs> Instead, say come to a meeting of Bible believers. Don't say the New Testament. Say the second part of a Bible, the New Covenant. In Israel, they say the Brit Chadashah. There's actually an explanation at the bottom that says this book isn't really Jewish, so try not to use the title at all. Just read it to them. I mean, you get the picture. The goal is uh, basically to use language to portray the gospel message in a, a way that's more palatable for a Jew to accept. But the fundamental belief of a Messianic Jew is in every way Christian. You simply take everything about Jesus and you repackage it in a Jewish package. You incorporate Jewish symbols and icons. 
You throw in Jewish traditions and you have a Jewishy Jesus. The extent of this is shocking to people who've never encountered it before. For instance, a messianic Pesach Seder. It has all of the appearances, it looks Jewish, but I assure you it's not. The matzah, they will tell you, represents the body of Jesus. The wine, his blood. The three matzahs represent the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There are holes and stripes in the matzah representing the beating of Jesus' body and piercing of his hands and his feet. When we take the matzah and we break the middle matzah, that also represents the breaking of Jesus' body because the New Testament said that he would be broken for you. The afikomen is hidden at the beginning, representing his death, and it's brought back at the end, representing the resurrection. So every aspect of Messianic Judaism is entirely Christian, dressed up in Jewish symbols and icons. You'll hear arguments like, but Jesus was a Jew. The apostles were Jewish. So accepting the Jewish Messiah is the most Jewish thing you can do. Of course, before you can employ these new tricks that I had learned, I actually had to meet a Jew. In the world I grew up in, I didn't know any. So how do you do that? You first embed yourself in the Jewish community with no intention at all of sharing Jesus. I was taught to attend Jewish events, eat at kosher restaurants, enroll in classes at the JCC, and volunteer. And when you volunteer, don't just take any position. Make sure you volunteer as a greeter. Hand deliver Meals on Wheels. Elderly people happen to be very lonely. They're desperate for attention and somebody to talk to, and they'll talk about anything, even if it's about Jesus. But whatever you do, make sure that you volunteer in a position that allows you to actively engage with and meet Jewish people. There happens to be no screening process at all whatsoever for, for these kinds of things. The most that would happen is maybe somebody would say something about me attending an event at the JCC and it might escalate to somebody higher up and eventually that person would say, so what? Evangelicals support Israel. What's the harm in a Christian learning Hebrew or Davidic dance? She's paying, let it go. Remember, initially, I wasn't there to share Jesus at all, so they didn't see me as a threat. And I wouldn't dare try to do that in these settings, or I'd surely be kicked out. They were simply a way to get my foot in the door. The goal was to become a recognized and friendly face in the Jewish community, to connect with people and to meet Jewish people. Once a relationship is formed, it's just between friends. When you're a friend, you're no longer a missionary. You're just a friend that happens to be a Christian. And between friends, naturally, faith comes up in conversations. The Jews I befriended never felt like they were proselytized, and that was easy. You just make sure they're the ones to ask. I was, of course, intentionally always leading them down the path of asking. Unfortunately, I was pretty successful in this, and that hurts me very much today. This technique alone worked with less affiliated Jews. My problem really came about with religious Jews. I was fascinated with the Orthodox world. I was inspired at how committed they were to the rituals and the traditions, but I'd been taught that those rituals and those traditions had no meaning and they were really empty because I knew that a Jew didn't have a relationship with God like a Christian does. They can't. As a Christian, I knew it was impossible to have a real relationship with God unless you have forgiveness for sin, which only comes through accepting Jesus. 
So to me, I couldn't think of anything more beautiful than bringing a religious Jew into a personal relationship with their Jewish Messiah. The Jews didn't feel the same way about this, I discovered. <laughs> In fact, a lot of religious Jews I encountered, they at least have somewhat knowledge of the Bible. These Jews were not going to fall for the emotional plea or my repackaging of Jesus with a Jewish flavor. To reach them, I was going to have to learn how to argue the text. The verses in Tanakh that I knew proved that Jesus was the Messiah. In my mind, if I could just get a Jew to read certain passages, they're going to see Jesus in them just like I did. So I armed with my Hebrew and English prophecy edition Bible. It gives all the prophecies that Christianity says was fulfilled by Jesus. I memorized every one of them to the point where I could argue them effectively. It wasn't easy. There are probably some of you in here that get excited when you see a missionary because you like to mess with them. <laughs> I definitely encountered those. <laughs> they seemed to be armed with cue cards, and they were ready with everything that I brought them. They'd tell me things like, the verses are mistranslated or you're taking that out of context, which I thought was absolutely absurd. I would respond to them saying, you're just regurgitating what your rabbi says to you. If you'd look at it yourself, you'd see. I seemed to get nowhere with them, but I was still determined. I realized that I was going to have to find another way to present this. So I started to try to prove their arguments wrong. They say it's mistranslated. I'm going to learn the Hebrew of that verse. They say it's out of context. I'm going to learn not to just quote the one verse, but the whole chapter and the whole book if I have to, and I'll present them Jesus in context like they wanted. I thought that maybe turning the tables on them would get them to look at the text with me, and it worked. They did. There was one man I uh, convinced to, to read a certain passage in Hebrew for me. It's a common verse used by missionaries. And when he read it in Hebrew, he got upset. He was stumped. And I felt I had him. I knew that he saw Jesus in that verse, and he was just mad that he couldn't explain it away. He refused to help me anymore, and he instead... He gave me a tape series by a Rabbi Tovia Singer. <laughs> Let's Get Biblical is an audio series giving the Jewish response to Christian missionaries. It's free online if you want to look it up. What he had given me was the cue cards that these Jews were using against me. He thought that maybe I was ready to see the fallacies in Christianity. I thought I'd, I'd hit the jackpot. I happen to know that religious Jews place a lot of trust in their rabbis. So I thought if I can disprove or discredit this rabbi, then they'll listen to me. So I set out to counter this counter missionary, and I was sure it was going to be a piece of cake. And that's when my world crumbled. I couldn't counter his arguments, not a single one. Using my own Bible, he completely destroyed every prophecy. And he was right. I kid you not, this tape series was an atomic bomb in my life. Now we're going to do something here that I have never done before. Rabbi Newson told me that I was going to be speaking to high schoolers. And when he told me that, I changed everything that I normally speak about because y'all are at a stage in your life where you're going to be making major life decisions. You're probably already beginning to explore 
your own ideas about religion and politics. You're going to be asserting your independence, and you're likely beginning to question everything you think, everything you feel, and everything you believe. You need more than just an inspirational pep talk. You need survival tools, because for you, every event could completely change the trajectory of your life. Missionaries know this as well. They know that you're on a journey to find your own identity. They also know that when you're in college, you're away from home and you're alone. You have little to no support or influences around you. For this reason, millions of dollars are spent every year placing representatives on college campuses and exciting activities and programs to bring you in and draw you into Christianity. The social draw alone is very powerful. So more than any other audience that I speak to, you need tools. So I'm going to show you a few examples of these things that fell apart for me. But before we do this, I need you to make a promise to me. There are many Christians, especially more liberal, liberal denominations, that have no intention to convert you at all. Judaism doesn't proselytize, convert people. We don't believe that you have to become a Jew in order to go to heaven. Judaism respects all religions, and Judaism believes that every individual, Jews and non-Jews, were created by God. I'm going to show you how the church manipulates the Hebrew Bible to prove their claims because I, I want you to know what you're up against. But the promise that I really need you to make is to never use what I'm about to show you to attack the faith of a Christian who's not trying to convert you. To do this would be lowering yourself to their level and doing exactly the thing we're complaining about. So I'm going to lead you through three methods used by the church to prove Jesus is the Messiah, and I'm going to show you how they're wrong. It's going to blow your mind, and knowing these methods will give you the power and the tools to completely destroy every argument that a Christian could bring. It was learning these methods that sent the atomic bomb into my life and blew my whole world to pieces. Here we go. A Christian knows that they're not going to succeed in getting you to read the New Testament. It's not something Jews want to do. They know that as a Jewish person, you place no significance or value on this book. But the way I did it myself was I knew that I could get a Jew to look at Tanakh. And all I had to do to do that was to challenge them and tell them that Jesus is mentioned throughout your Tanakh. I can prove it. In fact, he's basically bouncing off every page. And then I would add, this is something your parents and your rabbis are hiding from you. They don't want you to know this. Method number one. We're going to look in the book of Matthew. Matthew has a certain way of writing things that are a little different than the other Gospels. He not only gives us the description of something that Jesus did, but he gives us a, a verse in the Hebrew Scriptures that supports it. He wants to make sure that we understand that what he's describing about what Jesus did is not an arbitrary event, but this was actually supposed to happen. The Messiah is supposed to do this, and he cites a prophecy from the Hebrew Scriptures to prove it. So we're going to go to Matthew 2, 13 through 15. Your handout has it there for you. In the beginning of the book of Matthew, there's a narrative. And by the time you get to chapter 2, Jesus is already born. He's just a baby. And there's a man named Herod the Great. Herod the Great is not a nice guy. He finds out through astrologers that there's a little boy that was born in Bethlehem, and this little boy is basically going to usurp his power. What happens next is that Jesus needs to be protected. An angel appears to Joseph and tells him to take Jesus and his mother away to Egypt and keep him there. Basically, keep Jesus in Egypt until the coast is clear when you can bring him back. 
Of course, Matthew tells us the story of Egypt, the story of Jesus going to Egypt to escape the sword of Herod is not an arbitrary event. He tries to explain that this Messiah is actually supposed to do this, and he's going to support it by using the Hebrew scriptures, telling us that this was actually prophesied by the prophets of old. Okay, when we get to 2.13, it says, When they departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and be there thou until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. It's a very simple story. It's not complicated. If you look in a Christian study Bible, there are footnotes telling you where you can find this prophecy. Hosea 11.1. Let's take a look at that verse in the Hebrew Bible. It says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and I called my son out of Egypt. What do you notice there? What happened? Matthew only quoted half of the verse. And he quoted the second half of the verse. That's unusual, right? Usually when you're quoting a verse, you quote the entire verse. Maybe you leave three dots to let us know that more to go. But he only does the second half. He doesn't quote it in its entirety. Why? Because when you read it in context, it becomes clear that Matthew couldn't possibly quote the entire verse. If he quoted the entire verse, you'd immediately realize that this is in no way referring to the Messiah. On the contrary, this verse is referring to Israel and the Jewish people, not the Messiah. And it's not referring to somebody going into the land of Egypt, but coming out of Egypt. Is there ever a time when that happened? The prophecy in Hosea 11 was referring to our exodus out of Egypt. So method number one, taking a verse out of context. So when somebody says it's taken out of a context, that's exactly what it means. Meaning when you read the whole verse, the whole chapter, or even a few verses before or after, it becomes clear that these things They weren't at all what I was taught they were meant. That's method number one, which was shocking for me. It was like a thread was being pulled, and I continued this study, and the whole fabric of my belief system started to unravel and completely fall apart. And then there was method number two. Method number two is Psalms 22, 17. It's 16 in a Christian Bible. That's also there on your handout. I'm going to read it to you as it appears in a Jewish translation. This is a Sensino translation. It's done by Jewish scholars. And this is how they translate the verse. Where dogs have encompassed me, a company of evildoers have enclosed me. Like a lion, they're at my hands and my feet. Do you know who we're describing there? Can you tell? It's not so easy to tell. Let me read it to you how it appears in a King James Bible. Where dogs have encompassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. And let's be honest, who does this sound like it's talking about? (laughs) Jesus. But I asked you the same a moment ago, and you said it wasn't so easy. What word do you find there that tells you that there's something Christological happening? Pierced, exactly. They pierced my hands and my feet. That certainly sounds like Jesus. For those of you who understand a little bit of Hebrew, I've given you the Masoretic text. Can you look at that? And can you tell me what word is being translated as pierced? 
Ko ari. Right, ko ari is the word that they're translating as pierced. Does anybody know what ko ari means? Anybody here named Ari? Lion. Lion. Ari means lion. In Hebrew, when you put a cuff in front of, it means like that thing. So ko ari means like a lion. So this was an obvious agenda to make the verse appear Christological, like it's talking about Jesus, and then the claim that the verse is actually prophesying his crucifixion. Now, if we were to also apply that first method, take it into context, which is also very important, we realize that King David is using this language as a metaphor. And throughout the Psalms, he does this. King David, without a doubt, was one of the most illustrious kings. All of the righteous kings that followed were always measured up to David. But there was a very tragic side to David's life. David was a person who was a fugitive before he came king. Much of his family wanted to destroy him, and he was on the run. King Saul wanted to kill him. King David wrote very poetically. And throughout the book of Psalms, he describes his adversaries as lions and dogs that were hounding him, wanting to rip him to pieces. So again, we find when you read it in context, not only is this not talking about the Messiah, it's also not a prophecy at all, but it's a description of current events that were going on in King David's life. It was surrounding King David at that time. So method number two, you just change one word in the verse, and it changes the whole meaning. Now, some of you might argue that how do we know that the church intentionally mistranslated that verse? Maybe they were making an honest mistake, and maybe they think koari means pierced, which would mean that they would translate koari the same throughout the whole Bible. If that were the case, you'd find that in other verses. You can do that by going to a concordance, a Strong's concordance. You can look up ari, ko ari. It'll give you every mention of that word, every variation, and where in the Bible you can find it. When you do this, you find out that, in fact, every other mention of the word ari, ko ari, happens to be translated correctly. I've also given you Isaiah 38, 13 there, which uses the exact same variation of that word, and you'll see it's translated correctly. The only verse where they mistranslate it is showing in order to intentionally paint Jesus into that verse. And we'll move on to the last example that I want to share with you. Method number three. We're going to go back to Matthew. Now the coast is clear, Herod is dead, and Jesus is told that he can return. However, Jesus was born in what city? <laughs> Bethlehem. Except now we're told that Jesus resides in a different city. The name of the city is Nazareth. Remember, the way Matthew writes is he doesn't just state that Jesus is now taking up a residence in, in Nazareth. His style of writing is to let you know that the Messiah is supposed to do this because it's a fulfillment of the Hebrew scriptures. So exactly like we saw before, Matthew makes the statement and then follows the verse from Tanakh. It says, And he came to dwell in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, he shall be called the Nazarene. Does anybody know where that verse is cited? A guess? Don't feel bad. The verse doesn't exist. <laughs> it's completely... It's not. They don't even have it in there. It's completely made up out of thin air. If you take a look at this, again, in a Strong's Concordance, you can find every mention of the word Nazareth, Nazarene, Nazur. You'll see that the first time this word appears is this verse in Matthew. The word Nazareth doesn't even appear in the Talmud. Method number three is if you don't have a verse, just make it up. 
Again, these are just examples of the methods that I discovered in this study. When I started this study, I can tell you I honestly had no doubts about my Christianity. My relationship with Jesus was real. He was somebody that was one with me since I was a child. I would talk to him throughout my day, believing that he was with me and he was guiding me through everything that I did. My Bible was the infallible word of God. The New Testament was heavenly inspired by the words of Jesus himself. My faith was strong. It was the foundation of my life and my faith was my identity. But as I began to study and go through this honestly, each and every prophecy became another clear case of Bible tampering. I couldn't believe it and I felt violated. The rug was pulled out from under me and I experienced a full on religious and emotional crisis. It was traumatic and I went through every stage of grief, anger, betrayal, sadness, hopelessness, and Jesus. To discover that he was nothing more than an imaginary friend, that was beyond painful. And my identity, who was I without Jesus? Everything I said and did in my life was centered around this belief. Without that, life simply felt like it didn't have any meaning anymore, no purpose. I lost something and somebody that was so precious to me. At one point, I was crying and praying out to God so deeply, and something hit me. Are you stupid? Who are you praying to? I became so enraged that I threw my pillow at the wall and I screamed at the ceiling, you don't even exist. When you find yourself in such a hopeless state and there's not even a God to cry out to, it's just unbearable. Eventually, I mustered up the courage to call this Rabbi Singer directly. And I told him, okay, I've already come to grips with the fact that everything I believed is false, but I need to know something. Who was Jesus? If he's not who I thought he was, at least tell me there was some point in his existence. Did he even exist at all? Somehow, he knew that I needed more than just the answer to that question. He told me that I would struggle away to file away Jesus in some way that made sense. Because it's not easy to discover that you've invested your entire self into a lie. But the truth is, if Jesus was not the Messiah, then nothing else matters. Who he was, or even if he existed, just doesn't matter. Which was obvious. I got it. But I was still very unsettled. I explained the upheaval that I was going through to discovering that there was no God and he stopped me. He said, wait, you've simply discovered that Jesus is not the Messiah, but God is still very much there. In my bubble of grief, I couldn't separate Jesus and God because in Christianity, I'd always been taught that they were the same. He continued to explain, you now understand that a human sacrifice is not at all found in Tanakh. It's certainly not required for forgiveness of sin. You've simply got rid of the middle man and you can go to God directly. So I began to understand that maybe not everything is lost. Not everything was wrong. I simply needed to go through the process of separating fact from fiction, which I spent the next few years doing, deprogramming myself. But my trust had been violated. So naturally, I was critical of everything. I set out to learn Torah from scratch, which wasn't so easy. My standards and the burden of proof were pretty high. What text can I rely on? What's dependable? 
When I began to learn Torah without my Jesus filter, it was so beautiful and so inspiring. And all of those rituals that I thought were empty, when I began to learn the richness behind the traditions and the meaning behind the mitzvot, it just inspired me to learn more. And I began to see every mitzvah as a way to kiss Hashem and thank Him for opening my eyes and for every blessing that He'd given me. The conversion process was grueling. It was difficult. I was a single mother with very young children. It was a four-year process for us with additional hurdles since. Every convert will tell you that they go through their own personal mitzrayim. But today, I am so thankful my children don't know anything about Christianity. They speak Hebrew. One of them is a soldier in the IDF. They have a religious day school education that I envy very much. And they learn Torah unmolested in its purest form. The emotions of my journey feel like just yesterday, but this was actually 15 years ago. From the moment I left Christianity, I'd privately been active in the counter-missionary world in different ways, mostly behind the scenes. Very few people knew what I did with my days. It was my personal way of doing tshuva for my past, something I find most refreshing in Judaism versus Christianity is the demand for personal responsibility. We're responsible for the wrongs that we do, whether intentional or unintentional. Unlike Christianity, where you simply accept Jesus and you're forgiven for your sin as if you never committed the sin, there's no such concept in Judaism. Mashiach is not going to die for our sins. In the process of tshuva, returning back to God, is a powerful gift. It's a way that you can retroactively change the past. It's an amazing concept. There's a beautiful explanation in the Talmud regarding different levels of tshuva. The first one is tshuva me'ira. It's when you're confronted with the truth, you see it so clear that you can't delude yourself anymore. You see the wrong that you've done. You're not going to do it anymore. And what God does is he says, I'll take you back. And everything you've done until now is as if you were in a drunken stupor. And that's beautiful. But there's an even higher level of tshuva. Tshuva me'ava, tshuva from love. It's a way of not only turning away from the wrong that you've done, making a complete 180, but using that wrongdoing as a catalyst for everything you do from that point on. And when a person is able to do this type of tshuva, all of the negative things from their past become merits. Whether it was my intention or not, my years as a missionary inflicted tremendous damage in the Jewish world. So you can say that for the past 15 years, it's been my way of striving for this type of tshuva. However, when I moved to Israel, it became clear that working behind the scenes wasn't enough anymore. Evangelicals call themselves our best friends, our partners in the fight against anti-Semitism. The problem is, it's not so black and white. It's complicated. I see Jews falling over themselves, trying to jump onto this bandwagon. The more I saw how ensconced our government is with people that I thought should be on the most wanted list, our biggest threats, the more I realized I can't be silent. I didn't seek out a life as a missionary. I didn't choose it as a career, and knowing what I know now about the deception of the church, it's certainly not a title that I'm proud of by any means. But I do know that world. I know the language. I know the who, the what, the when, and the how to infiltrate a Jewish community. If there was an ever an opportunity to take the negative that I have done and turn it around, this was it. So I started to come out of the closet. 
and publicly share how and why I know about the tactics used to convert Jews to Christianity. I founded an organization called B'nai Benenu is a nonprofit organization that monitors missionary activity in Israel and abroad. We're based in Israel. We have an office in New York as well. We work with government and community leaders to raise awareness of Jewish evangelism and the danger to the Jewish people. And we encourage safe and consistent boundaries with these interfaith relationships with Jewish communities worldwide. That's what I've been doing. But let's get back to you. Is the answer to combating missionary problem for each of you to learn the New Testament in order to respond to them. I, I work very closely with Rabbi Tovia Singer, now the same rabbi that I learned from. Uh, we attend many conferences together, and at one of these, it was right outside Washington, D.C. Somebody came up to him afterward and introduced himself. He mentioned that he worked with the Secret Service. The rabbi was intrigued and said, what do you do? He said he had a unique position with the government. He's in charge of protecting the US currency. The rabbi was fascinated and started asking about his job and said, so how much counterfeit money do you have? <laughs> you must have like thousands of fake money. He says, that's not exactly how it works. Our guys train using the real thing. They learn every detail, the feel of the paper, the weight of the paper, the ink, the fibers. You know, there's tiny bits of colors and blue thread that's like smushed into the paper. He explained that the level of training they have is so detailed, how they know the real money, that there's, they're able to recognize a counterfeit right away. Some of you here have the tremendous privilege of a day school education. Some of you may be an after school program or a Sunday school Hebrew program. Some of you learn on your own through AISH or NCSY or the OU. My message for you tonight is to take your Jewish education seriously. We're not losing people because they have something better to offer the people who are falling into the ranks of groups like Jews for Jesus, they know very little about the faith they're being asked to abandon. If they knew the real thing, if you know your Bible, your own Bible, there's no way that anybody's going to be able to sell you a counterfeit. Thank you for having me.